get rolling. I was excited to talk about this topic because I feel like it's been a part of the work that I've done throughout my uh, personal career and then the volunteer efforts as well. Myself being a black girl, but also working in domestic violence and working with people who were survivors of sexual assault, the reality of not only how this impacted adult women, but this started in childhood was crucial to me. Working with teen pregnancy prevention and knowing that pieces of that were wrapped in one's self image and wrapped in their community and the way their community supported them. This was important to have this conversation. I wanna start by just giving us some context about what is the words that I'm using and what do those words mean? So people who know me would tell you that there are a few simple things that I love. Candy, a discount, especially on clothes and shoes. And so when I decided to take some new professional photos, I wanted to do a picture with a color pop. I always loved how fun and playful it looked. So when I was sending in my materials for this conference, I thought about this picture and I second guessed myself. I second guessed myself. I felt like it showed my personality, but I wondered if it was too much. I tried to examine what was too much. My calves, my thigh, the neckline. I thought, where does a picture of a happy, dark skinned professional black woman turn into a picture that is too sexy? That's what we're talking about sexual objectification. It's about zoning in on the particular characteristics like hips, butt, breast, while overlooking other physical attributes like the nose that I got from my father, the smile that is always a little too big, or my hands with a fresh set of press on nails. This way of noticing a woman's curves, pulling out pieces of her rather than seeing her as a whole her whole presence and essence. This dicing of a person isn't new. We have been put on display since we are trafficked here. I could talk about how black women's bodies were on display next to men and children as they were sold from one person to another. That was objectification, but not sexual objectification. The story of Sarah is the most obvious example of the sexualizing of a black woman's body. Her true name remains unknown. She was a South African Khoisan woman who spoke four languages and played the harp. She'd been a wife and worked as a servant until her husband was killed. His death led to her becoming the property of a free black man. He chose to conspire with a white man to have her body become the main attraction on display in England. She was instructed to dance, and bend over wearing a costume that was supposed to represent her culture. She was visually assaulted as she stood in a cage, part of a circus, then later became the property of an animal tamer. Those who attended the public event where Sarah's holy body was on display, visually assaulted her, poked at her if they were willing to pay a little bit more. Her body was considered the main attraction For her to stand as she did would have been one thing. For individuals to pay a little money to have her as part of a post party, it was $40 of what today would be. But does the amount of money matter? Her body, like other black women's bodies, is a product in and of itself. There's a price for a body to be displayed, bought, and generally disrespected. Abolitionists filed a court case on her behalf. Though her voice was heard in the courtroom, her words were not. Rather, they went through a translator. How often are mere voices heard with no concern for the words being spoken or the person who speaks? She got no justice in that courtroom and the abuse continued. Her body was on display for four years. And then when she passed on to the other side, 
a plaster of her body stood alongside pieces that had been removed post-mortem and that was on display for more than 150 years. After ongoing public outcry of indecency, in 1974, she was removed from the museum floor. Yet her body remained at the museum and they fought the request for her body to be returned to her homeland. She was seen as the property of the museum and it would be almost 30 years before her body was returned home and she was laid to rest. The broader community objectified her, the courts ignored her cries for justice and she went too soon, living only to her mid twenties. This reality is not just her story. Others suffer the same fate in its entirety or perhaps just one particular way. Like many black women, she went well before her time and there was no one protecting her. The black woman is the community's foundation. So when the foundation is cracked, neglected and disregarded, the whole may fall. At best, the church disappoints its most loyal, but perhaps it goes far beyond that and harm is caused. The black church was formed out of desire for community. There was a need for a space to be fully oneself, a place of respite from the world that at times denies black people's basic humanity and punishes authenticity. A place that could be a reprieve from racism, anti-blackness, and the expectation to bite one's tongue. A place where code switching wasn't needed and one's exuberant vocal response are seen as participating rather than distracting. These demoralizing realities touch each of us to differing degrees. While sexism, homophobia, and transphobia as another weight on the shoulders of some of us. There remain so few places for an individual to find community and bring their whole selves into a space. The foundation of the church is a faith centered on the teaching of Christ. Over time, this meant organizing to bring about equality for the entire community. It meant being the safety net to ensure individuals were fed, clothed, and can get what they needed to have a space to sleep that was safe. Some churches hold true to these teachings while also perpetuating the social norms that tear down individuals. The church can be a sanctuary as it once was created to be a place that protects black people in particular black women from the outside world. Black women continue to need protection, both in the outside world and within the four walls of the church. Protection can be about not having to be subjected to physical violence, emotional abuse, or anything else. Protection from a negative message on a billboard, from illness, or the reality of a situation. These notions of protection are important. When I think of protection, Having worked in the sexual health field, I often think of protection from unintended teen pregnancy, pardon me, unintended pregnancy or sexually transmitted diseases and infections. This is how I came across the work and research of Natasha Crooks. Her research posed the question, why do black women have higher rates of STDs than other groups? I can sum up her research in the one word protection the need to focus on protecting Black females. She was direct, explaining it was about protecting bodies, blocking stereotype messaging, and rejecting the image of Black females as sexual objects. She explained, when protection is present throughout one's development, then girls build a positive connection to their body, and they become women who exemplify this reality. How do we reinforce this message to young girls in their lives? She broke down protection further, identifying what was needed at particular phases of life. During the initial phase, girl, 
would need protection from others in part due to their being naive. Women are responsible for protecting those around them. The role of protector was assumed when someone reached adulthood or it could begin sooner if they became a parent. That middle space between being a girl and being a woman, she referred to as the grown phase. In the grown space, the focus was on learning how to protect oneself. Yet the word grown itself has a negative connotation. Though no clear definition came from her research or any of the conversations she had with research participants, it was a label thrown at a girl who behaved in a particular way that was deemed inappropriate. Perhaps others were pointing that out and were saying that she was acting fast. Natasha Crooks used that notion of fast behavior or she identified it as a fast path. This journey along the fast path began when a girl was not protected as a child. This little girl was not given the information she needed when she needed it. She was raised with feelings of fear or shame. She was silenced. And then along the way may become a victim of childhood sexual abuse. The absence of needed information continued as she walked along the fast path. She didn't have the information necessary to protect herself or someone to protect her. She may have experienced sexual assault, been diagnosed with an STD. Along this path from girl to grown, she too would be battling feelings of fear or shame. At some point, that little girl would cross the line from child. She'd be expected to protect those around her, having never received the protection or information to accomplish that task. The fast pass is likely not the path we would choose for ourselves or send the girls around us down. We would want them on the cautious path, as Natasha referred to it. On this path, our girls will be protected by having the information they need before needing it. They would be surrounded by individuals who are working to protect them from physical harm and protect them from the stereotype messages that bombard them daily. People would be helping the young girls and ladies build their self-esteem, see their inherent self-worth. As they grow up, they would be in a nurturing environment that allows them to learn what is needed to protect themselves from unhealthy relationships, pregnancy, and STDs. No one path is a direct path. Childhood experiences of trauma does not guarantee ongoing experiences of trauma or assault. Just as being protected as a young child does not ensure a steady walk along the cautious path. One's life events, peers, information's accessibility and ongoing protection can change one's trajectory. We want individuals to be in a safe, supported environment where they have peers on which to rely. This helps women and girls develop a protective space and to stay the course on the cautious path. I point out earlier that it's not solely about being protected from sexual behavior related outcomes or literal violence. What's deterring individuals from this safety, from this protection is more than just an instance or several instances in time. It's about what we're facing daily. Natasha highlighted that black women and girls are surrounded by stereotype messages. These messages are in media, their culture and society as a whole. I'm gonna ask you to take a minute to think about the last three images you saw of a black woman. What was she wearing? What was she saying? What was she doing? I'm gonna ask you to take a moment to shut your eyes and think about a word or words that you would use to finish 
these sentences. Black girls are. Black girls are. Black girls should. Black girls should. Black women are. Black women are. Black women should. What messages could the images that you conjured up or the adjectives that you use fall under? What was positive? Did you think of someone you know? Or perhaps it was all fictitious. Black women, girls, and femmes are surrounded by messages that perpetuate that they are on display. Media shows Black women and girls as the sum of their parts. Cultural norms that hyper-focus on one's body rather than one's true self, the notion that one's body is holy is absent. Objectifying messages are part of the experience of everyone under the umbrella of woman. And I'm not even diving into the reality of how body size, one's shade, hair texture, and abilities also feed into the notion of who is sexy and who is not. Peggy Orstein is an internationally recognized speaker on gender issues. Her work revolves around the discrepancy between men and women's sexuality. And she broke down the difference between sexualization and sexuality explaining. One could disentangle sexualization from sexuality by remembering that the first sexualization is fostered onto girls from the outside. The other sexuality is cultivated from within the focus then should be on repairing what is hurled at Black women and girls. That is a starting point. That is something everyone can take part in, pushing back on the narrative of sexualization and fostering healthy sexuality. One crucial place that this can take place is within the church. I encountered the book Jezebel Unhinged and this quote jumped off the page to me of what does it mean to be overly sexualized. I was 11 years old when a prominent male elder of my childhood church told my father that he could not focus during altar call because he was sexually overwhelmed by my pre-pubescent derriere. I was lightly chastised for looking too grown and prohibited from ever again wearing the black and red fishtail cotton dress that donned my 11 year old body that Sunday. Black girls are given rules for covering and closeting while black boys are taught to explore and conquer. The reality of the blame being put on a small child instead of the expectation of appropriate behavior for a grown man is the reality. The reality that one person's clothing can be so distracting is not just something we see or hear about in churches. It's a message that is brought into our neighborhood schools as well. Long before I made the desire, the choice really, to become an educator and become a teacher, I was getting ready for my first day of school I was putting on my Catholic schoolgirl uniform, talking with my mother, going over the normal first day of school angst. My parents were always very direct with me regarding racism. Having grown up in Charleston, South Carolina, barely post-segregation, my mom did not hold any punches. She let me know that the bar was high for me and that as a family, that was also true. She acknowledges that 
I would likely be entering a school where people would have no other reason to disregard me than my race. And like most young black girls, I was told the reality of being a black woman meant being twice as good, expecting twice as much and having to deal with twice as much. I was told about overcoming and what the fight would look like to be seen and to be heard. I was told about the opportunities that I may miss because of discrimination and that sometimes I wouldn't be able to recognize why something was happening and to take the time to think about that it was not me, it might just be the other person. Now my mother did her best to prepare me for the racism that I would endure in that school. And wholeheartedly, that school provided me access to the best education that she believed I could have and deserved. I was prepared in that way, the discussion around racism, the conversation around my being a black girl the intersection of racism and sexism was not something we really discussed, though we were discussing it. We didn't say these two pieces are the problem. When these two things intersect, this is how people see you and will treat you. We didn't talk about what adultification is. Adultification for black girls is the extent to which race and gender taken together influence our perception of black girls as less innocent and more adult-like. Adultification is part of this false narrative that young girls are doing things intentional, that they're malicious, instead of it being the reality of childhood immaturity. It's about the connotations of a young black girl being seen as a grown black woman and none of those positive characteristics of black womanhood being placed on her. Instead, it is the negative stereotypes and characteristics become what we see when we look at little black girls. When I was younger, I had the nickname of Sass. Now, we often talk about sassy girls, and sometimes that title is said with love and playfulness. But do we mix the notion of being sassy, and do we tie it only to a particular group? Are we talking about little girls, little Black girls that are behaving like grown women? Do we no longer see them as little girls, as innocent, in need of protection? The reality of it is when we talk about schools, we have to start campaigns that say, let her learn. When we talk about the school to prison pipeline, black girls are also disproportionately disciplined, but black girls behavior is attributed to their personality traits, that they're mean and disrespectful, rather than the reality that their behaviors are not choices, but unintentional childhood behavior. When we think about what does it mean to be a black girl in this space? What does it mean to be protected in this building? How are we seeing children and not adult women who we already have chosen to demean and minimize? Children are not afforded the same opportunity to be playful and defiant to define their boundaries and push, push the limits as children do. They're being disciplined for more than just what they say or don't say. For black girls, they're also being disciplined for what they're wearing. They are being told that they are distracting from the learning environment because nothing distracts from the learning environment more than a spaghetti strap tank or a pair of jean shorts. They are removed from those environments. Yes, sometimes for a short period of time, 
they're taken out of that classroom. The priority is not on their education. The priority is on the other people's eyes. The reality that this individual is responsible for what other people are doing, that she must change what she is doing to try and change their behavior. Short term, we have going and changing your clothes. Maybe that means a parent has to come and provide you other items. But long term, we have young girls that are suspended. We have people who are missing out on their education because of clothing. This one building has been the focal point for childhood as girls are making their way along from child to woman. This building possesses a opportunity to show that they belong in this space, that their voice and presence matters. But we leave these girls out and we push them out with discipline, whether that be behavior or dress code violations. We also push them out when we don't provide comprehensive sex ed. We leave them out when we don't talk about what happens with unintended teen pregnancy and how will their education continue when they become a teen parent, if that is the choice that they make. Education, especially sex education, continues to be a conversation across the country. And when we look at the schools that are more likely to teach abstinence only, when we look at the young people who have access to pregnancy prevention, who are taught about STIs and are not rushed into adulthood, we have to look at the places that are majority black and brown the places that are missing comprehensive sex education because the narrative has become faith and religion and abstinence only teaching. How does someone protect themselves when they do not have the information on how to protect themselves? Not merely from the reality of unintended teen pregnancy, but also from the life that they are wanting to pursue how do they protect themselves from going into adulthood before they are ready? One of the most dangerous places for a black woman is a hospital. And so when we're not providing young people the education to prevent pregnancy, when we are not providing people access to choice if they do not want to parent, we are pushing them into a hospital system that will kill them. We are saying that this place where you are supposed to be getting health care from a person who's supposed to care about your health is safe, but we know it's not. Throughout childhood and young adulthood, black women and black girls are taught to not be too loud, to not be argumentative or bossy, to not be too much. And when they enter a system where they have to fight to be heard, to be listened to, to be cared for, where they have to fight for their lives, this messaging needs to be one of protection and prevention and one that says your voice should be heard in every space. You are not just an advocate for yourself, but you are advocating for the life of another person as well. We are not zoning in on a message of behave. We are encouraging a message of fight to survive, which has unfortunately been a message we have received over and over again, because we live in a country in which prevention is emphasized, but money and race are two of the real prevention factors from entering into a life or death situation. 
What is it then that we say about teen mothers? How do we talk about them in our communities? How does the church frame who they are? The church has a way of trying to counter the messaging that undermines the beauty that is black women and girls. The central theme remains that your body is a negative distraction. It further marginalizes black women and girls to be quiet, to cover up, to make themselves small. This marginalization, though it is geared at black women and girls in reality impacts our broader community. When we know that our community is filled with women that are raising young men, oftentimes alone, the way that we teach black women to think not only about themselves, but to teach young boys to talk and think also about black women is crucial. Our families and our communities, we choose to instill this maturity and strength and independence because we know that we wanna counteract the structural racism and for women that intersectional racism that is faced. But can we start with the message that you are a holy being that deserves to be protected and loved and respected. And the broader society does not see that, refuses to acknowledge that, but you are part of our community. And each person's behavior creates a community. So a toxic community can transform into a beloved community when we are instilling and sharing and encouraging messages that sexual objectification is wrong, that black women and girls shouldn't only have to think about themselves and what others see and can recognize the positives of what they inherently are. The first step towards this beloved equitable community is acknowledging that it's not a reality, that we have to take care of each other and we have to put blame where it belongs. The violence and inappropriate behavior and statements that Black women, girls, femmes, and trans individuals are subjected to is not their fault. They are the targets. They are targeted because there's this cycle where People, especially women, are seen and glorified as sex objects in the movies, in our print, in the imagery that we see across our Facebook feed or our Instagram stories. That messaging of who and what Black women are creates a reality where people continue to perpetuate that women are part of a product, that women are their bodies. And it engages in a way that now we're not just saying these things, we're not just seeing these things, we're able to say, well, she wore, well, if she hadn't, we are talking with our young girls about prevention and ignoring our young boys who oftentimes are not just per perpetrators of violence, but our young boys under the age of 10 are also experiencing sexual violence. And when we frame the conversation as if only one group is sexualized and the power is in men, we are undermining the community that we can build with both genders and all of those who fall outside of the binary. Each person's behavior creates this community. 
And what does it mean for us to have fellowship? How do we build a community in which protection is provided at different points in someone's life? Where I see protection not as redirecting what someone is wearing, but redirecting how someone is looking. How do I talk about the reality that Black women are subjected to and center them as not victims, center them as survivors of situations? We know that Black women are resilient, but that does not mean that they don't deserve to be cared for. When our young girls are cared for, when they're supported along the journey to womanhood, we can develop this multi dimension way of seeing ourselves. And that encourages not just our girls, but those around them to also see an individual for all that they are. Where can we create those spaces for Black women to share their experiences, to acknowledge the reality of pain and heartache that they have endured. Where can our Black men release the hold of power and recognize the strength that is being pushed to the side? When we have community and fellowship, we can say black women in all of her grace and glory is seen. We are resilient and strong. We bear children and really we birth movements. We are asking to be cared for with the same ferocity that we care for all of those around us. We're asked to be seen as more than our bodies and our paychecks or what happiness and joy we can provide to another. We're asking others to recognize the legacy of objectification, of black women being sex objects and solely child bearers. We are asking the church which was created to be a brave space, to be that space for black women, to acknowledge that that space is not in the broader community. We are saying that now we have to ensure our children have the information they need before they need it. So they are protected knowing not just the name of the parts of their body, but that it is their body. That people are not shamed for becoming pregnant, that people are not shamed for having an STD or silenced or live in fear of having the conversations that need to be had. That words like grown and fast are not just thrown out at people but they're interrogated for what is really the message we're delivering. We're saying that being black and woman and having to be twice as is not the way we wanna to continue to be. We are seeing our children as children, not little women and little men as children who deserve to be protected in their homes, in their schools, and in their church buildings. We are pushing back on a system where women enter hospitals and leave those hospitals in body bags. We are pushing back on a system that says your voice is heard and not listened to. We are fostering messages of black girl magic and melanin queens and having accountability for everyone in our community, not just some. 
And ultimately, we are becoming a place and people who care about protecting others, not just ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. My Lord, my Lord, that, that, was, that was phenomenal. And again, incredibly timely when it comes to the value on the black body, especially the value upon the black female body. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm going to invite our respondents to come and join us. You can go ahead and turn on the cameras, please. And um, before they begin with their questions, we invite you to pose your own questions to Sam, and you can put that into the Q&A um, uh, portion as opposed to the chat. I'll try to keep, I'll try to observe both. Um, but if you have questions about Sam's presentation, please go ahead and, and feel free to do so. Um, several of you have already asked the question, will the slides be made available? The slides for all of our presentations will not be made available. Uh, what we will do, so you can still see this, is this uh, presentation is being recorded and it will be uploaded to YouTube. And then that way you can go back and see um, what the various, uh, uh, the content of the various presentations will be. Another question that I have received is, is there going to be an evaluation? And there will be. Um, and again, because this is new for all of us doing it online, uh, you normally get your evaluation at the tail end. But I also realize we got people who are coming and going. And so I'm going to put into the chat, it's an online evaluation. And I'm going to put into the chat now and after each presentation. And so you can go ahead and fill it out as best you can. You don't need to put your name. It will be recorded. And again, we just appreciate, again, your participation. But at this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our respondents and um, to go ahead and ask questions. So is um, uh, doc, Dr. Shawnee, are you with us? I am with you, but I can't turn my camera on. There's something with the host has to give me permission. Let's see if we can do that. Okay, does that work? Yay. Yeah, oh, there we are. Yes. I'm going to disappear and uh, Dr. Daniel Sykes, I'll let you begin with the first question. Okay, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, Sam, thank you very much um, for the hard work that you put into your writing and presenting this morning of a very important and timely ethical issues and the concerns that drive the over-sexualization of black women and girls. Um, all I can say is kudos to you. Nice job, nice job contextualizing your work and giving us a sense of what we need to do to keep this issue at the forefront. Um, as I had in my cycle of prejudice and oppression, you can say born black girl, women and girls into society and go around that same circle, that same cycle. And so the first question um, that I have for you is in your paper, you speak or you spoke repeatedly about the needs for the black church to be a place of protection. And you even had that pointedly put out in your PowerPoint slide, protection as it provides safe spaces for the healing process of black women and girls. Can you tell us specifically um, what this protective and safe space would look like? Who would be the facilitator if there were focus groups or groups that these women and girls could come to? What would be the ground rules for sharing? Where would these places be held? Um, in the church proper, in the church hall, in an adult formation room? or maybe you know, even at a special counseling center where there are safe spaces. But, and then what would, what would that all look like? What would it entail, a program and a process? I think the first part, and I said it in different ways, but I really wanna emphasize it, mm -hmm. is access to information. The ongoing desire to prevent information as if it's providing protection is really counterproductive. And so how are we engaging in conversations, not just about friendship and what that looks like in a person-to-person -person way, but how are we talking about health? 
-hmm. that you deserve to be treated with respect. This messaging sometimes in uh, Christianity of forgiveness mm -hmm. doesn't take a time to take a pause and say, you were harmed. Mm -hmm. Let's acknowledge that. And so how are we engaging in conversation? How are we encouraging our school systems to have comprehensive sex ed if we're not capable of having the conversation at home? Knowing that some kids may never engage with the adults around them. Mm -hmm. So how am I sharing a book with them? Mm -hmm. And doing it in a way that isn't saying, if you like this thing, you should be embarrassed. Mm -hmm. Our bodies are our bodies. We should find joy in them. We should not be embarrassed by them. And that's really, to me, part of it is just the way we talk about sex and the way that we encourage or discourage access to information is one piece of it. The other part to me of community is how are we pouring into the women? How are we pouring into women's ministry? How are we pouring into those young girls, those teen moms that we talk about? How are we actually supporting them? Mm -hmm. that's where energy should be put mm -hmm. in. How do I ensure that you have what you need to not only feel protected in these four walls, mm -hmm. but as you go out into the community. Good. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And the second question that I have um, is drawing on your biblical and theological imagination and creativity. From Genesis 16, 1 to 15, we find um, the Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar story. Mm -hmm. What role do you think that Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar's the narrative narratives play in promoting the stereotype of the over-sexualization and single pregnancies of Black women and girls? Yeah. I think that I actually did a paper on that particular mm -hmm. piece, and I didn't focus on it in that way. I focused on the relationship between Sarah wanting, or Sarah I, wanting access to power mm. and a child being tied to that in that time. Okay. And my statement was that really she was engaging in reproductive coercion. Mm -hmm. She was convincing another person to have a child so that she could maintain her status. Mm -hmm. And I would bear to say almost the opposite is true in some ways now. Mm. where we encourage young people to not have children because of how that reflects on our status mm. and how we're seen as a community or as a black woman. Mm. That notion of how you're behaving is reflecting on me and I don't want other people to think you are a representative. And teasing that out and recognizing that everyone deserves to be their own person. Mm -hmm. And it is great that we can care for each other, but we also have to ensure we're not putting a burden on someone else to question all their behaviors, not just for themselves now, but for all the other people who share their identities. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. I think we had time for just two questions. Um, do I have time for a third point, one or no? Yes, let, let's go, go ahead and save your third question, but let's go ahead and move on to Dr. Dwayne and we'll get okay. the, uh, the other questions okay. that are coming in through the chat. Okay, good. Thank you. See, I was getting ready to hear that third question, Dr. <laughs> oh, it's okay. <laughs> let's go on with you. Well, well, well you know what? Again, we're, we're, we're trying to get it all together. So Dr. Shawnee said, since Dr. Dwayne said, go for go for your third question. Okay. Yeah, I, I was interested in that conversation. <laughs> yeah, because, um, you know, Part of, part of the reason why I put this in there is as a bioethicist, you know, and theologian, I'm just always concerned about healthcare and healthcare access. And um, many times we do have to access healthcare and may not necessarily know how. So the question is, how can the Black church collaborate with Black healthcare professionals or even healthcare or medical systems to bring about hope and healing for black women and girls who suffer from sexual violence. And you talked a lot about it, you know, in your paper. And I noticed that you said something um, about it, but I'm trying to turn that page in terms of the abuse of the medical system to black people mm -hmm. to see where's the hope. Is there hope in that? Or do we just totally disconnect ourselves from healthcare, which is not a good thing either. I think we have to be ingrained in healthcare mm -hmm. because ultimately, 
it's not going to get better if we're not in it making it better. And that's the sad reality. So to me, a couple pieces of that, um, I know you're focusing on the sexual assault and I, I will get to that, but I think the other pieces long before that, how are we inviting health educators into our spaces? Mm -hmm. How are we providing materials? When I was uh, back in Omaha, we had a program where there were condom boxes all around town. So people could just pull it out, if, pull a condom if they needed it and they didn't have to go searching for it. It was completely free. And we had churches taking part in that and recognizing when we are caring for not only someone's spiritual health, we have to care for their physical health. Mm -hmm. So how are we using that church hall for STD testing mm -hmm. and not making it something shameful that you have to go to another place and be embarrassed about, but this is important that your health matters. Mm -hmm. And we are saying that in this space and the services that we provide mm -hmm. and the people that we invite and the way that we talk about what's going on in the broader community. Mm -hmm. I think also another piece to me with my lens and doing repro work is how are we having doulas? How are we supporting mm -hmm. the ways that we have had children and birth children mm -hmm. in our own way mm -hmm. in teaching the practices of that? and the sacredness of our traditions. Mm -hmm. Hospitals are a place, but we can provide actual care. Mm -hmm. And that to me is what's being asked of us. I think the other thing as far as responding to sexual assault, the more that we could continue messaging that a person has some accountability, the more we're influencing shame. Mm -hmm. So what does it look like to not only change the way we're talking about survivors, in our one-on-one -on -one conversations, but how do we do that from the pulpit? Mm -hmm. How are we creating a space where here's a support group in our location for survivors? Because mm -hmm. we're saying this space and our space should be together. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Dwayne. <laughs> thank you so much and thank you, uh, Sam, for uh, your work, I commend you on addressing this issue of over-sexualization. It, it, it's a critical uh, issue that we need to discuss and we need more sustained reflection on. Uh, and I also wanna thank you for uh, showing a little bit of your own vulnerability uh, as you share your work and your experience I think that uh, adds a, a, a lens that, that uh, helps us see where you um, set the context. And I also appreciate that you uh, demonstrated the intersectional quality of the experience. I mean, you bring in a range of variable, variables and factors that are at play here, violence, uh, health, medicine, and sexuality, religious and cultural hegemony and, and cultural production. I think uh, they, they are complex and they are, are confounding and uh, your window into it I, uh, helped us uh, ground it a little bit better. I, I want to talk about something you had in your paper because especially on the quote that you got from uh, the book Jezebel Unhinged, mm -hmm. uh, you talked about the culture of silence and the culture of silence to me, um, it, it, it has a lot, of, a, a lot of explanatory power and I just wanted to get your thoughts because uh, you 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 draw out, you draw some of it out indirectly, but I wanted you to speak to it in terms of your own line of inquiry. That role of of what the, how does culture of silence play in the exploitation of Black women and girls? What role it plays in maintaining the status quo of how women, Black women and girls are viewed, mm -hmm. um, especially in in religious and political institutions. Um, the role that it plays in reinforcing some of the archetypes and stereotypes of the strong black woman who can take what you throw at her, especially young girls when you call them fast and grown. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is there a way, uh, uh, just talk a little bit about how that culture of silence is uh, playing a role in where we are and in, in, the, in the world that you paint of the over-sexualization of girls? Yeah, I think we have to be honest in saying silence is the greatest power. To silence someone is to continue to exude power over them. And that's often something that abusers will use when they're in a domestic violence relationship and recognizing that if you don't get the chance to say what's going on, then you don't get the chance to for someone else to care. So when we have a society of silence and, and young people are just 
stuffing it down, I would say, and not really engaging with what's going on around them, then they don't get the opportunity to be cared for because other people don't know what they're experiencing. They don't get the opportunity to have their experiences normalized, to know that this isn't right, but others have experienced it as well. It denies community when you don't get to share authentically what you've gone through or how you've overcome because we continue the message of overcome, of strong and overcome and overcome and overcome. But if we don't tell you that there are things we overcame, what are we talking about? <laughs> Why am I strong? What has made me strong? And strong is not healthy. We cannot equate those things as equal. That is to me what the concern is when we talk about silence. We're not saying I have pain. We're not saying this is wrong. I deserve better. And when we do that in little ways of just shushing a small child, we're starting that cycle of what I have to say isn't as important as this other person's feelings. How I feel isn't as important as this other person's behavior. And recognizing that notion of silence becomes perpetuated of just be quiet and we don't address the little things. And unfortunately, it leads down the road of not addressing the real mental health that needs to take place. Thank you, thank you so much. And, and I, I do wanna suggest a, a, a book. I, I was looking for it in your, your bibliography, but uh, I don't know if you've had the Too Heavy a Yoke, Black Women and the Burden of Strength by uh, Shaniqua Walker Barnes, a, a mm -hmm. very good, good uh, account of that. Uh, I also was very pleased that you really uh, made use of Emily Towns' uh, womanist ethics and cultural production of evil. Um, that's a seminal text in the, the role of cultural production on the injustices visited upon Black women's bodies. But I want to get a sense of where do you think we are given, especially the work that you do, but the, the, this issue of over-sexualization. Uh, I got a sense of a check-in with where we are in the culture and cultural production. We are now in the middle of a shift, a major shift in cultural production mm -hmm. and in the critique of cultural production. I mean, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking about prolific new producers of content like Lena Waite and Issa Rae, Ava DuVernay, Brittany Cooper and Alicia Garza. I'm thinking about the influence of Black Lives Matter. Uh, and you, you, you named some of those slogans, uh, Black Girl Magic, all these things that are sort of shifting the nature of the discussion. Uh, even that Black feminist, womanist, and queer perspectives are penetrating the public square. They're, they're getting book deals. It's a part of the conversation. Um, and so what do you think is the impact on this topic? I mean, we're still, of course, uh, experiencing the over-sexualization of Black people. But what is our prospects? What, how are we doing? Where do you think we are? I obviously have to draw on my own experience, right? And I talk a lot about colorism. Those people who are close to me will know it's an ongoing conversation for me. And I, the books that I see now are not the books I saw as a child. The imagery around natural hair is not the imagery that I had. And so it's the way that we have put more into the conversation. Mm -hmm. We have acknowledged that it is not right whether that be in a personal one-on-one -on -one conversation, whether that be with our policy, there's been a lot more policy around natural hair discrimination. And so we're doing pieces of this is how you should be treated. This is what ultimately it means to have pride. And how are we leaning into that notion of not just being able to overcome, but to be thrive and have pride in who we are is a conversation that I think is just now starting and it's still a side conversation. If I look up the top 10 songs, are they still going to be those positive messages, right? I had a conversation with my sister. Um, there was a thing going around on Facebook for like Miss Teen USA and, and so on. I don't remember all the titles and all of them were black women. And we took a moment to notice that. And what I noticed was the darkest skinned person in the th of the three was the only one who had straight hair. And that idea of like pieces are true. Mm -hmm. We do see more representation, but colorism remains ingrained and not talked about. So it's continuing to have the conversations that 
Black girl magic is real, <laughs> that we can do amazing things, that we, you know, win elections, I feel like is the conversation right now. But how are we elected to our school boards? How are we in our day to day lives feeling empowered? That's the part that I think we haven't really gotten to yet. And, and uh, Sam, I was going to ask you a little bit uh, in, uh, about your your voice and your social location, but you did a wonderful job of, uh, of doing that in your presentation. So uh, I so I, I want to shift a little bit. I wanted to, you know one of the things that I've really in the last ten years that I have have been open to and been looking at, and I think what is happening in terms of this topic, but just black women and girls in general, especially from the womanist perspective, is the role of narrative. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering like uh, works like The Bluest Eye from Toni Morrison or The Color Purple from Alice Walker. Mm -hmm. I just wanna get from your vantage point again in this, because those books specifically deal with uh, violence against black girls. And I just wanted to get your sense of the role uh, how do you think the role of narrative, especially powerful narratives like that, can play in uh, not only mitigating against the culture of science, uh, silence, but opening up our conversations a little bit? Uh, uh, some dangerous works, but how uh, your thought about how what role it could play in doing that? I think it's oftentimes how we're first encountering it. I know I watched The Color Purple. That was something that like. I had and I engaged with, and that was media that was important to me. And I still, you know, having a, a rough day, will go play a little song from that movie and thinking about that, that's ingrained in culture. Mm -hmm. And for me in narrative, I love narrative. I love the ability to share and to discuss. Mm -hmm. And it's important that we're doing that not solely around pain. Yes. And that to me is what I don't hear as much the things that go viral, the things that become best-selling books are pain. That's where I think we're missing an opportunity. When I came across Natasha's work, um, one of the things I did is I started doing discussion groups. It was just me and four women. And we would talk about our experience of being protected. We would talk about the messages we received, the media that we were around. And it was such a healing space. And I only did it with five people because we would have way too much talk for <laughs> the hour I, or so I had planned. But we're missing those real honest interactions and narratives in our day-to-day -day life. How am I talking to my cousins? How am I learning my aunt's story and what she has endured? I think that's the part of narrative that we have um, not always engaged into the same degree is just our family's narratives mm -hmm. and learning all the strength that's there. Thank you, thank you. I um I uh I, I really appreciate that again the idea of the, the notion that uh, those those works uh, do do confront head on the the production of black paint. Uh, I also just want to leave you another with another um, work of uh, sexuality in the black church. I I uh, by Kelly Brown Douglas. I mm -hmm. uh, I it just one of the things that I I think is important as a theological and, theor and theoretical scaffolding. Uh, for some of the questions that you raise, and especially the 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 resistance that that she talks about, sex, a sexual discourse of resistance. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And Sam, we have some questions for you from our um, audience. And okay. so, um, again, I'm going to try to get as many in as possible. Um, some are in the chat. Some are in the Q and A. Um, hopefully you can get your questions into the Q&A portion. <laughs> so the uh, first question is, how do, how do you imagine justice unfolding for congregations and community spaces where perpetrators are in their midst? Mm -hmm. So there's two pieces to that that I'm hearing is like justice and what is justice and who makes that definition? Oftentimes we have a blanket system of justice, but what I want justice done may not be the same as someone else. So I think it's important to listen to the people in that space, especially if my assumption would be that this perpetrator and also the person who experienced the pain are in that same space. So what does that person want? How do I center them and not center my idea of what they need? 
So that I think is the first part of, of justice. And I think the other part for me that oftentimes is missing when we talk about sexual assault and violence and all of those things are, where do our young people learn? There is some real misinformation about consent, about whose people's bodies are, and that goes across gender. And so we can't hold someone accountable without also acknowledging all of those pieces. And so to me, part of it is acknowledging what, what can we do better, whether that be just conversation, whether that be how are we supervising our young people? How are someone who says, I no longer want to be in the same space as this other person? How do we honor that request and put the needs of that person above the power or the needs of someone who's perpetrated violence in some way? Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Another question is, was there a middle phase between girl and grown? I think so, but I missed it. Can you name it and spell it out? Yeah, there really wasn't. So it was girl and then grown and then woman. So grown was that middle phase, which in my brain, and when you hear the word, you might not have think, thought of it as that middle phase, but that was the middle phase that she spoke of was grown, was the middle phase. Um, she was really clear in her research that like that age is different for some people than others. And when they are, have to start learning how to protect themselves is different. And that's what that grown phase was, was no one was in charge of protecting you solely. You were learning how to navigate that space. Thank you. Uh, the next question is the legacy of enslavement includes actually accusing enslaved black women and girls of degrading the race, quote unquote, by being forced to engage with white men. Are black women and girls being blamed and shamed for being abused? Are black women helping the world partly in reaction to their shame and its self-care uh, deprioritized at least partly because of feeling shame and a sense of not deserving to to exist. So that's quite a bit. So hopefully you- All right. So- And I can break it down if you like. Heard the first part around um, engaging with white men. And that was yeah, just- let, 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 let me do this. Okay, so, yeah, break it down. Uh, yeah. Are black women and girls being blamed and shamed for being abused? Definitely. I think we see that constantly um, in how we talk about survivors, how we frame, even in the sense of not just sexual violence, but we're hearing it right now as people continue to lift up um, Breonna Taylor's name of like, she was these things. So therefore her life has more value. Regardless of the job someone has or the dreams they have for the future, their life has value. And so when we have to give a disclaimer before we say that someone was a survivor or what happened to someone was wrong, then we are saying who you are matters more than what happened. Yeah. And then the second part of that question is, um, are black women helping the world partly in reaction to their, to their, to their own shame? And is it self-care that de, uh, de, um, de, deprioritize at least partly because of feeling shame and a sense of not deserving to exist. Now, I can't speak for black women, let's be real, but I can say self-care is not prioritized because we don't have time <laughs> to prioritize self-care. That is the reality from a financial standpoint, but that's also the reality from where do I seek out that self-care? Where do I go into a space and someone says, oh, just go sit down somewhere. Instead of saying, hey, can you help do this? Hey, I need you to do that. So self-care is great and I would love to have it every day, but it's how do other people talk about self-care? Not as something that someone's being selfish. That to me is how we get to it. So we as, as black women can say like, I don't have time for it. And instead of people saying, well, you need to make time for it. How can you help me make time for it? That to me is the way we have that conversation differently where we're encouraging self-care but recognizing why it's not there yet 
I don't know if that answered the question. It did in my uh, I believe so, because of that. A related question is, uh, what, what would you see, um, Sam, as um, ways that predominantly LGBT or same gender loving congregations have a unique opportunity uh, uh, to be aware in providing safe space for black girls and women? Right. I think that to be real frank, sex, sexualization doesn't just happen for black girls and black women. In the queer community, I would say the way that we sexualize bodies in general is a conversation to be had. And in a space that is oftentimes focused on how do we support people who are seen as other in some way or want to celebrate, how are we celebrating people, not people's sexual behaviors, not focused on the sexual piece, but celebrating as whole people. That to me is the difference in a space where people are choosing to recognize, hey, we all want a place where we can talk about our partners where we can talk about the relationships that we engage in and it be celebrated to the same degree. I think it's continuing to say sexualization happens to black women and girls and sexualization happens differently in this setting. So let's name that and support everyone in this setting in a way that is authentic and knowing that black women and, and black girls and I would say, let me move that over, as someone who identifies as a bi person, that bi people experience extremely high rates of sexual violence. And that is partly due to not just being in the bi community, but the bi phobia that's in both communities. And so when I look at black women, it's how are we existing in both communities? And when I look at the LGBTQ community and LGBTQ faith groups, how are we supporting people who are in both communities? Whatever that both may be for them, whether that's trans and a person of color, whether that's someone who's bi and has ability concerns, how are we recognizing all of those both and not framing our whole system around the majority, whether that be cis white men, whether that be gay straight men and not centering one group over another. Very good. Um, someone was taking notes and wanted to get the uh, what was Natasha's last name? Crooks. Crooks. So it's C-R-O-O-K-S. And if you look up like girl to grown woman or girl grown woman, you'll find all of her research. Very good. So, uh, someone has asked, have you viewed the documentary Black Love? And if so, uh, what did you think of it? And does it relate to this con conversation? I have not viewed that documentary. I will put it on my to watch list along with the books I'm gonna read. Very good, very good. Um, someone asked the question, I'm going through your, some of the chats, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> was wondering, I, it's kind of higher up and I lost it, but uh, it, it was in regards to um, this in relation to black trans women. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I saw that question. Um, there's two pieces of that. One, when I think of being overly sexualized, very true for Black trans women. The difference I, I look at when I'm engaging in this conversation is the way that Black girls are socialized around their bodies and when that socialization impacts how they're then engaging with others and their own self-esteem. So it's both and. What I see and I have dialogued with people about is trans women, especially trans femme, more femme presenting women um, are overly sexualized. And I believe in my opinion, it's more the femininity that's sexualized across the board. And it's thinking about how does that become ingrained in how we see ourselves solely as our bodies and how do we love ourselves as we are. There's a lot more to that for a trans person to love their bodies and recognize the way that people are treating their bodies. Amen. Uh, another question is, how do you help Black girls and women distinguish actual power from acting out the myth of being in charge of their sexual activity, uh, which may actually be attempts to become the master, quote unquote? Right. Mm, don't like that attempt word, but I'll go with the rest of it. Uh, the reality of it is we all want to feel like we have power over the relationships we're engaging in. And so whether that be a, 
emotional or sexual relationship. I want to feel like I am seen as an equal if that's the dynamic me and my partner have. And so when we're engaging in these conversations and thinking about as a young girl, I'm instilling in them that you are an equal, that no one is better or worse than in a relationship, that both people deserve respect and boundaries that those two individuals set. Not one person makes all the rules and the guidelines. And when you frame it, starting from what is healthy, equitable relationships look like, in my opinion, it takes away from that power dynamic of like, no, I'm in power. No, you're in power. Because we both have learned what healthy relationships look like. And that goes for both people. I recognize the conversations of Black, black women and girls, but how are our young boys perpetuating that? That they're supposed to be the leaders. Instead, if they were taught and engaged in a conversation around being equal, that you are from one body is from another as an equal, then it isn't a power dynamic that one person's trying to pull or push. It is both people coming in and saying, we both want a healthy relationship. And how does that look? And the accountability is on both people. Who is doing more of the pushing and pulling? Society can breed that as it being more of a concern. But those people in the relationship have some accountability. And if you're a powerful woman and you are engaging in behavior that not only is pleasing to you, but pleasing to your partner, kudos to you. Cause that's two happy people. And that's what the, the goal is, is both people are happy in the relationship. Not both people are feeling empowered. That's not our goal is to focus on who has power in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Another question is um, in your opinion, what songs are young girls listening to and do they reflect positive images? Even if they speak to the power of females, do they still project images of positions that are filled with sex as it relates to pleasing men? Right. So first part is songs that people are listening to. I will tell you, I have a 13 year old and I feel like all he listens to is 15 second clips from TikTok. So that's probably the most that I'm hearing, but I look at what are those TikTok trends, right? What are those songs that are in those trends, but what are also the imagery that are in those trends? And um, I know there was a trend going around where it was like a silhouette of your body. That is focused on the curves of your body. That is in the definition of sexualization. Did I freeze? Okay, it looked like you froze, so I thought I froze. Okay. <laughs> but so it's some of it's that um, in what's being talked about in the broader media. And there are those songs, but there's a difference, like Peggy had said, there's a difference in me feeling sexual. And I had a young person say one time, like, just because you sexualize my body doesn't mean that I'm a sexual object. Like that difference of, I can love my body and point out the breast and the boobs and the pieces that other people are choosing to sexualize. And that's not feeding into it because my priority is to myself, not to someone else. And it's who's holding the rationale for the why to me that makes it good or bad um, cycles that we get into. And let's, I'll also say the songs nowadays, I love them. Um, they're a little raunchy, so <laughs> I will be authentic, but in that is saying, I get to decide my own body and how it's shown. And if I choose to show it in this way, it is my choice, not respectability politics that are trying to shame me into otherwise, or leaning into the male gaze. How am I actually seen as an individual who has choice not tied to anyone else? That's the piece I think we're sometimes missing. And um, Sam, we have one final question for you is, um, do you have advice for what men can do to help support black women and girls? Yeah, tons. But I think just starting with the compliments that you get, like, if your first comment is you're so pretty or you're so this or you're so that versus like your smile is electric. Like what are the pieces in the way that you're talking about people around you? How are you role modeling to not only other boys because 
we often say girls role model for girls and boys role model for boys, and that's not real. How are the way you're talking about women seen by the young girls around you in the conversations that you have? Are you talking about, wow, I like this or that about her body? Are you talking about the voice that she has, the talent that she brings? So it's in the way that you talk about it to me is the most basic is how are we talking about the people around us and how are we pointing out toxicity? So when someone says, well, she did fill in the blank, you are cutting that off immediately. You are not feeding into the notion that someone can wear something or someone can say something that allows someone else access to their body. That to me is huge, is the way that we talk because that leads to our behavior. And unfortunately, a lot of behavior happens behind closed doors that we don't know who people really are, but people here are especially our, our little kids. My son and me talk all the time about objectification. We talk about when high profile athletes are accused of sexual assault and dialoguing about that in a way that pushes back on the reality that black women and girls should do something different or you know, you're just so tempting. What? <laughs> like, how is this person tempting you? It's in the words. Wonderful, wonderful. Samantha Carlin, thank you so very much for your scholarship and being our Souls of Fire fellow. And we're just, again, so honored to be educated uh, by you. And thank you for taking the time. And of course, if we were all together, we would give our little art claps and round of applause again, because you, you so deserve that. So thank you. Well, thank y'all for being here. So I wasn't just talking to an empty screen and throwing amazing things in the chat. I'm going to read through that. That means so much to me um, to hear the feedback and, and thoughts that y'all are willing to share with me. Yeah, absolutely do that because quite a few of them are were just comments. And so, uh, you, you, yeah, def, def, 